Thanks, Gary. Um, I suppose I should start with the obvious point that um, freedom of speech, even under the protection of the First Amendment in the US, has never been an absolute value. It's always been subject to a range of qualifications, and everyone's familiar with Oliver Wendell Holmes' dictum that no one's at liberty to shout fire in a crowded theatre. So I want to start today by talking about some of the legislative and the common law restrictions on freedom of speech in Australia, some of them, I would say, more justifiable than others, before moving on to the cultural climate that can, I think, have a very significant impact on the kind of public debate that takes place in relation to social, economic and political issues. Uh, in terms of legislation, I was going to start with section 18C of the Federal Racial Discrimination Act. You might think that section 18C has been over-discussed, but I think it's a useful place to start because it's been the subject of a long-standing debate in this country, and in many ways it symbolises the recent discussion about free speech in Australia. Uh, it's also useful to look at Section 18C because there are somewhat similar provisions, but dealing with a much wider range of community groups uh, in legislation at the state and the territory level. Uh, can I remind you that Section 18C makes it unlawful to do an act that is reasonably likely in all the circumstances to offend, insult, humiliate or intimidate another person or a group of people because of their race, colour, national or ethnic origin. Uh, there is an exemption in section 18 capital D for anything said or done reasonably and in good faith in a number of situations, including academic and scientific discussions and for uh, what's described as any other genuine purpose in the public interest. Uh, the real complaint about section 18C by various people, and including myself over the recent years, uh, was that it's not always possible to have a robust public debate without offending or insulting persons or groups with a high level of sensitivity. Yes, there are some exceptions that I've just referred to, but amongst other problems, it's necessary to show that what was said was reasonable and in good faith. These are highly subjective judgments for a court or a tribunal, if it comes to that stage. And in any case, they can only be made after the publisher of the material in question has already been involved in lengthy and costly legal proceedings. It was Voltaire who said that he had only been ruined twice in his life, once when he lost a lawsuit and on the other occasion when he won. <laughs> As everyone knows, the proponents of freedom of speech lost the contest over Section 18C. Uh, the Abbott government promised to substantially repeal the provision prior to their election, but they quickly reneged on that promise when it was opposed by a range of ethnic groups and legal professional bodies. Uh, there was a flood of submissions from these organisations, naturally very little from the other side because there are no community bodies established to defend freedom of speech. The Turnbull government 
tried to amend the legislation in 2017, but could not obtain the votes in the Senate to achieve that object. Uh, at the state and territory level, I'll use the example of the Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Act, uh, which is perhaps the broadest of all the state and territorial statutes, but it prohibits conduct that offends, humiliates, intimidates, insults or ridicules another person on the basis of 14 different kinds of status including marital status, relationship status, and family responsibilities. This provision had some publicity in late 2015 when a complaint was made to the Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Commissioner about a booklet distributed by uh, church authorities to Catholic school students on the subject of marriage. The complaint related to the publications teaching on same-sex marriage, uh, but presumably it would be open to anyone in Tasmania living, living in an unmarried uh, heterosexual relationship to make such a complaint as well. Anyone who has read Evelyn Waugh's Brideshead Revisited, I hope everybody, will recall that it's Catholic teaching that unmarried heterosexual couples are living in sin and doomed to the eternal fires of hell. And that sounds like an insult to me. It's true that unlike section 18C, the Tasmanian provision has the requirement that a reasonable person would have anticipated that the other person would be offended or insulted. But putting aside the fact that that's another value judgment for a court or tribunal, it may well be that a publisher does anticipate that some persons would be offended or insulted in the course of a vigorous public debate on moral questions. It's also true that somewhat similar to 18C, uh, the Tasmanian legislation has an exception for a public act done in good faith for any purpose in the public interest. But again, this can involve highly selective judgments and requires the defence to be made out affirmatively by a publisher in the course of a lengthy and expensive legal proceeding. Uh, one of, it seems to me, the irritating aspects of this debate is that proponents of provisions like Section 18C in the Tasmanian legislation almost invariably say that they're in favour of freedom of speech, but that this concept is not inhibited by these kinds of statutes. Uh, I don't know why they don't simply say that freedom of speech is not an absolute value and that on these occasions it's outweighed by a higher value, that is, the protection of some groups from offence and insult. I would, of course, not accept that proposition but at least it's an argument, unlike the contention that freedom of speech is simply not confined by Section 18C and its counterparts. Uh, none of this, of course, is to say that incitements to violence against particular groups in the community should not be unlawful. As it happens, they've always been unlawful under the criminal law. But this is very different from expressions of opinion that may be simply offensive or insulting. There's a very great difference between hate speech, as it's termed, and material that might be offensive to some persons in the context of a serious public debate. But for some commentators, of course, hate speech is simply anything with which they disagree. It might be thought that the answer to this and other problems concerning freedom of speech is a Bill of Rights, but in my view there are three reasons why that's not a solution. The first reason really arises out of democratic political theory, because what happens under a Bill of Rights is that political, social and economic questions are transferred from elected parliamentarians to the courts, to unelected judges. 
And it's important to realise that political, social and economic questions don't become legal questions when they're given to a court. They remain what they've always been, but they're now decided by a court. This is, in some ways, the judicialisation of politics. Second objection to a Bill of Rights, I would say, is a more practical one, but well illustrated by the notion of freedom of speech under the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. Uh, courts in the United States have started with the general proposition that speech is to be absolutely free and then devised numerous qualifications to that principle. So nothing really changes there except that the qualifications are imposed by the courts rather than by the legislative bodies. Third objection to a Bill of Rights, in my view, uh, concerning pr freedom of speech is that a provision like Section 18C would very likely be held by Australian courts not to contravene the principle of freedom of speech in any event. Uh, this is because what John Kenneth Galbraith used to call the conventional wisdom, uh, which in Australia is that these kinds of provisions are reasonable restraints on freedom of speech. I'll say something more later about the uh, concept of the conventional wisdom. Uh, it's often said by media organisations, or particularly by media organisations, that the law of defamation is one of the greatest inhibitions on freedom of speech in Australia. Uh, the law of libel had its origins, of course, in the common law, but there's now in this country uniform legislation in all the states and territories on this subject it represents an attempt to strike a balance between freedom of speech and the protection of individual reputation. It's easy to be critical of the length and the costs of defamation litigation, but it's hard to avoid that kind of litigation when many defendants are large media organisations and have the resources to engage teams of very expensive lawyers. Um, there's been uh, established uh, this year a defamation working party, and I should declare that I'm a member of it, that will make recommendations to the Council of Attorneys General, who will then decide what changes, if any, are to be made to the existing legislation. Uh, there'll always be debate about whether defamation law strikes the right balance between the competing values of freedom of speech and protection of reputation. Uh, there are, however, two changes that have been proposed by media organisations that might tilt the balance further towards freedom of speech. Um, the first is the requirement introduced into the United Kingdom defamation legislation in 2014, that a publication must have caused or be likely to cause serious harm to the reputation of the plaintiff before there can be any liability for its dissemination. This would presumably have a, a chilling effect on trivial claims, although it might be noted that there were already some judgments of Australian courts that would allow these kinds of actions to be dismissed at the outset on the basis that the length and cost of the litigation would be completely disproportionate to any harm suffered to the plaintiff's reputation. The other change proposed by media organisations is to the current defence of statutory qualified privilege which requires the conduct of the publisher to be reasonable. This normally involves a consideration of the reliability of the sources relied on by the journalist in question and the research carried out before publication. Uh, the media takes the view that the courts have interpreted this test too stringently and have argued for the test under the English legislation that requires a reasonable belief on the part of the publisher uh, 
that the publication was in the public interest or a notion of what's been called in some of the cases in England and in New Zealand, responsible journalism. Uh, what about the problems created by publications on social media? It may be, of course, that the first of those proposed changes, bear in mind that none of them have been uh, adopted to date, but the first of those changes, the requirement of serious harm to reputation before an action can be made out, that that might dispose of a sizable proportion of those claims uh, based on items on social media. Uh, and these claims have increased dramatically in recent years. But depending on the number of persons with access to them, some publications on social media do have the capacity to be extremely damaging to a person's reputation. Uh, there can't perhaps be any real solution to this problem until there's a greater realisation in the community that making an allegation against a named person on social media, no different to making the allegation on the front page of a national newspaper. In each case, the publisher is exposed to exactly the same risk of liability. There is, of course, a separate problem about the legal liability of internet hosts like Facebook, Twitter, search engines like Google for the publications uh, of individuals that they facilitate. Uh, these are very thorny legal questions with some inconsistency between various decisions of the Australian and the English courts. And one of the purposes of the defamation reform process is to provide some legis legislative solution um, to this particular problem. Um, and I, it, it might be noted that in June, the New South Wales Supreme Court held that uh, media organisations were responsible for the comments of readers that were added by readers to the organisation's Facebook posts. That decision's gone on appeal, but it may be that the defamation reform process will deal with the whole problem in a much broader way and that, that therefore that particular aspect of it uh, will be overtaken in any event. Uh, one way in which the 2005 legislation did reduce an area of defamation litigation was by effectively banning actions by corporations, except for non-profit bodies and small companies with less than 10 employees. Uh, you might think that large corporations have staff whose sole function is to promote and to publicise their activities, and so they're particularly well placed to respond to any allegations made against them. Uh, there was quite a lot of opposition to that provision at the time, but the submissions to the Defamation Working Party uh, seem to suggest that this provision has now been generally accepted. Uh, the law of contempt, which is another restriction on freedom of speech, is designed to strike a different balance from the law of defamation. It's a balance between freedom of speech and the administration of justice. Uh, usually this amounts to an inhibition on publication that might prejudice a pending criminal trial. Uh, although there can be contempt in relation to civil proceedings for, by example, intimidating litigants to abandon their rights. In relation to criminal trials, however, the explosion of information by way of the internet and social media in recent years raises the question of whether jurors can now be completely isolated from material that may be prejudicial to the accused person, uh, but will not be adduced in evidence. There is, of course, effectively no law of contempt in the US because of the First Amendment. Um, it can be noted that it's a criminal offence in New South Wales for a juror to access the internet and obtain information concerning the accused 
at a trial in which the juror is involved. Of course, whether or not um, that sort of access ever emerges um, depends on the case in question. Uh, it might be thought that in many ways the sheer volume of information now available on any particular subject uh, lessens the impact of individual pieces of information on a prospective juror. Uh, there are still some clear contempts that can occur, such as publishing the prior criminal record of the accused during the currency of his or her trial, but it's obvious that the law of contempt needs to take account of the technological changes over the last two decades. Um, it, it should also be said that there's a real public interest often in the discussion of some prominent criminal cases and that this, this has always been a defence to a charge of contempt where the prejudice to the pending trial is incidental to that discussion. Uh, there is a form of contempt known as scandalising the court that's designed to deal with allegations against judicial officers. It's seldom been invoked in modern times in either England or Australia, but the Victorian Supreme Court threatened to bring contempt proceedings against three federal ministers in 2017 when they criticised sentencing decisions of the court for being too lenient. Ministers were forced to apologise to the court. Their comments were not particularly well expressed, but in the absence of allegations of dishonest or corrupt conduct, uh, it might be thought that the courts should not be oversensitive to criticism uh, of their decisions uh, in, in this modern, more modern era. Uh, another value that competes with freedom of speech is that of national security, a balance that was the subject of some public debate uh, and still is um, after search warrants were executed in June by the Australian Federal Police on journalists employed by the ABC and News Limited. Uh, Almost everyone, I think, would agree that this is a legitimate competing interest, uh, that is national security, but historically the tendency of governments in all countries, including Australia, has been to classify as secret a great deal of relatively innocuous information. Uh, one of the paradoxes of the WikiLeaks saga was that the vast bulk of the material disclosed presented no real threat to any country's national security, although Mr Assange seemed to be indifferent to whether they did or not. Um, under the relevant provisions of the federal criminal code, every leak by a ministerial office, Parliament House in Canberra, constitutes an offence by the person providing the information and possibly also by the journalist receiving it. You won't be surprised to know that there's never been a prosecution in those circumstances. Uh, the official secrecy provisions at the federal level were amended in 2018, last year, but it remains an offence for a public servant to provide official material to a journalist and publication by the journalist may also be an offence depending on the security classification of the material uh, and its damage to national security. There are heavier penalties for the disclosure of official material by public servants where the information in question is harmful or potentially harmful to national security. Um, the defence for the publication of the material by a journalist is if he or she reasonably believed the publication was in the public interest, except in the case of the identification of security officers or persons in a witness protection program. Uh, questions of national security lead perhaps uh, naturally to the issue of terrorism. Under the Federal Criminal Code, it's an offence for a person to advocate the doing of a terrorist act, which is broadly defined to mean conduct that causes, 
and is intended to cause serious harm to persons or property or a serious risk to public health or safety when done with the intention of advancing a political, religious or ideological cause and with the intention of in, or, or with the intention of intimidating a government in or out of Australia or the public or a section of the public. Uh, I doubt that anyone would uh, object to it being an offence to advocate the placing of a bomb in a suburban shopping mall, uh, but it may be that these provisions are wide enough to extend to the advocacy of violent acts in conflicts outside Australia. Uh, what, for example, about someone in Australia who calls publicly for the launching of rockets into Israeli suburbs from Palestinian territory, or the killing of Palestinian militants by the Israeli security services. If these laws had been in place, would they have extended to someone in Australia in the mid-1930s who proposed the assassination of Adolf Hitler? Those persons who recommend violence from the safety of their own armchairs may not often be the most attractive beneficiaries of freedom of speech, but to paraphrase Oliver Wendell Holmes again, the doctrine of freedom of speech is really only tested when the speech in question is hateful to many members of the community. Uh, I should say something briefly about the doctrine of the freedom of political communication under the Constitution that uh, in, in, in high court cases over the last three decades. Uh, the cases before the court over this period can broadly be divided into those where there's been a challenge to what might be described as public order legislation and a challenge to legislation on the subject of um, electoral funding. Almost all the former challenges, that is public order challenges, have failed, including those in 2018 to Victorian and Tasmanian statutes that effectively established zones in the vicinity of abortion clinics where persons attending the clinics could not be the subject of confrontation by those opposed to the operations being carried out in the clinics. A number of challenges, on the other hand, to electoral uh, funding regulation have been successful, including those brought against New South Wales legislation in 2013 that prohibited donations to corporations and unions, and in 2018 that limited electoral expenditure by third party campaigners to $500,000. I should say that I appeared for the state of New South Wales in those cases, um, but uh, I, I, I'm tempted to say that in many ways these cases might seem not to be about free speech but about very expensive speech um, and to overlook many of the problems that are caused by political donations. Uh, it might be remembered that the original decision of the High Court in 1992 that discovered the implied freedom of communication in the Constitution struck down federal legislation that was designed to effectively remove the cost of political advertising on radio and television for political parties and so to avoid much of their fundraising activities because so much of those funds went into, particularly into television advertising. Uh, there is, of course, now considerable public funding for political parties uh, and their campaigns. Uh, I mentioned earlier Galbraith's notion of the conventional wisdom, and there's developed in Australia in recent years a conventional wisdom on a whole range of subjects, for example, climate change, border security, freedom of speech itself, uh, to name a few. Uh, this consensus is maintained by large sections of the media, 
uh, by all legal professional bodies, most teaching staff in universities, major sporting bodies, literary festivals, and quite a number of the boards of large corporations. Uh, some of these views, of course, may be quite supportable. Uh, you yourselves may hold some or all of them, but that's not the point. The point is that I think no young person in our society could publicly espouse a contrary view if he or she wished to pursue a serious career in any of those areas. You may think that this is wildly exaggerated, uh, but as someone who was once familiar with university common rooms, I'd be prepared to wager a large sum that any young aspiring academic who consistently contradicted this conventional wisdom at morning tea in the staff common room in, two th in 2019 would find his or her career prospects rather severely affected. Uh, and most young academics would know this and would confine their public views accordingly, whatever their private thoughts might be. We're getting there. Um, I don't suppose these bodies uh, have a tea room anymore, but they no doubt have office lunches and other social events where contradiction of the conventional wisdom would not be favourably received. This is not because everyone in the such organisation subscribes to the conventional wisdom, but those that do not know better than to express their views. Um, so it seems to me that in many ways, this conventional wisdom is one of the greatest inhibitions on freedom of speech in Australia at this time. There are, of course, strong strains of what sometimes now in a political correctness in England and the United States. But for reasons that are not entirely clear, this development seems to have been taken to extremes in Australia. One factor may be that in a much smaller society, there is simply less scope for diversity of opinion than in England or in the United States. All this may sound rather pessimistic when considering the position of freedom of speech in Australia in the immediate future. And it's certainly true in my view that public debate on important social and political questions has become more inhibited over recent years in Australia. There are still individuals and journals who are prepared to initiate robust discussions. They often have a problem getting any response from the smug holders of conventional wisdom, but hopefully at some stage there will be a reaction against the current claustrophobic climate of opinion. <laughs>